Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You are so awesome, so righteous, so holy. You are so honorable. For there is no one like you. What can be compared to you? There is no one like you, O oh Lord, for you are love. That is who you are. And I thank you, Lord, for being love. The very definition of love, the very essence of love is who you are. And Lord, I just thank you for saving a wretch like me, for thinking about me before the foundations of the earth, that you would show mercy unto this earthen vessel of clay, that you would bestow your amazing grace before you even created the world. You said that I was yours and you loved me first. And so because you love me first, I love you, O oh Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve you all the days of my life. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to praise your name forever and ever. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have your name upon my lips as a blessing. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the very lips of clay that you fashioned in order to give you praise. I thank you for this opportunity, O oh Lord. And I pray, Lord, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would dwell in me richly, that my cup would overflow, that the seven spirits of God would be manifested to the full. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of yod heh vav -Hey. I pray for the fullness of the Ruach HaKodesh. For you said, O Lord, in your word, and your word is truth. You said in your word, O Lord, that we are to walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. And so, Lord, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would dwell in all born-again believers so that we can walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. For we see that your day is coming. We see that the day that you have foretold long ago is at hand. The woeful day, the dark and cloudy day, the day like no other day where you will do your strange work, where you will bring to pass your strange act. And oh Lord, as all the saints of God join in fellowship, we watch and pray always so that we can be accounted worthy to escape all the things that are about to come on the earth and stand before the Son of Man. And so here we are, Lord, ready to receive teaching, ready to receive instruction, ready to receive a word from the Lord. So teach us, O oh Lord, teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Open up your word unto our eyes so that we may behold wondrous things out of your Torah. We thank you in advance for hearing our prayer. And we pray Psalm 91 upon all the body of Christ. That you would protect us from all the evil that the plans of the enemy has in store. But we know, O oh Lord that you are a shield, hallelujah, that you are a rock, hallelujah, that you are a tried and true stone, hallelujah. And because we have built our faith upon the foundation that no one else can lay except that which is laid, which is you, the stone that is cut out without hands, the everlasting rock, and upon that rock my faith rests. My faith rests upon the everlasting rock, the rock of ages, the king of glory, Yeshua HaMashiach. And I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for this sure foundation. I thank you, Lord, for that tried and true stone that can never be moved. Hallelujah. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. That is what you said, O oh Lord. And your word is truth. You said only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Hallelujah. 
And so, Lord, keep us in the ancient paths where the good way is so that we can find rest for our soul. That narrow road that only few people find that leads unto everlasting life. May we walk in the paths of righteousness as you lead us and guide us into all truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In the name above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask it all. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open. Everything will change. And I just want to clear up a few misconceptions that I've been hearing lately about the four horsemen, the first four seals being already released. And we're going to do what God says to do. You see, because this is the only way. <laughs> now, if you got another way, other than this way, well, your way is wrong. And that's why there's all this bad teaching out there. But if we do it how God says to do it, my goodness, hallelujah. If we just do it the way God tells us to do it, we will have right understanding. And so I want to go to Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10, in order to prove how we are going to understand that the four horsemen, the first four seals, have not been broken. It's an impossibility, hallelujah. And we're going to go through the Bible once we get the foundation, hallelujah, which is the word of God, Jesus Christ. Once he sets us straight, we're going to go through the Bible to prove it. So Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10 says this. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Do you want knowledge, my friend? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Do you want to understand doctrine? That the first four seals have not been opened. That none of the seals have been broken. Do you want to understand doctrine? Well, God tells us how to do it. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Only those who have got off the milk and have progress to the meat are going to understand these things. But if you're still on the milk, well, you're not going to understand doctrine. <laughs> and God can't teach you knowledge because you got to go a little bit deeper. Hallelujah. You got to get off the baby food. Hallelujah. <laughs> you got to get off that milk. Okay. Now that milk is good. Okay. Milk does the body good. You need the milk. Hallelujah. In order to grow. But if you want knowledge, hallelujah, if you want God to teach you knowledge, if you want to understand doctrine, <laughs> You got to be weaned from the milk. Okay, You got to get past the elementary foundations of the faith in order to eat that filet mignon. You want you a ribeye? Okay. You want you a T-bone steak? Well, God says this is how you get that T-bone steak. Okay. <laughs> you want your filet mignon? You want your New York strip? Okay. <laughs> you want your tomahawk? Well, the only way to get it is to do it how God tells us to do it. And he tells us in verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Okay, so we're going to go here a little. We're going to go there a little. We're going to go line upon line. We're going to line upon line. We're going to precept upon precept because that's the only way to eat that T-bone steak. <laughs> Now, is your belly hungry for that T-bone steak? Meaning, do you want knowledge? Do you want to understand doctrine? Hallelujah. Well, let God teach us because he's already set the table. <laughs> Bible says he set the table in the presence of our enemies. Hallelujah. Okay. And there's enemies all around. Okay. But in the presence of our enemies, God, he's already set the table. He said, get down and sit down, child. <laughs> Get down, child of God. Sit down at the buffet. Okay. <laughs> Sit down at the buffet. Kick back and eat. Hallelujah. Because God came to give us rest. And that rest is glorious. Hallelujah. No longer are we slaves to this world system. But who the Son sets free, we are free indeed. Therefore, we are king's kids. We're children of God. He says, come on and dine. Hallelujah. <laughs> come on and dine at the table. Hallelujah. <laughs> But the question is, are you hungry for that T-bone steak? Meaning, are you hungry for knowledge? Well, I pray that the spirit of knowledge would dwell in you richly. Do you want to understand doctrine? Well, God says, come on, child of God, sit down. 
pull up a chair to the table because God has a feast. Hallelujah. So let's get into this teaching, my friends, and let's understand what the Bible says about the order of events in order to prove without a shadow of a doubt that none of the seals have been broken. Hallelujah. So let's go here. Let's begin with Revelation chapter 6 because this is where we see uh, these first four seals. Some people are out here teaching that these seals are already broken and it's an impossibility. Okay, it's an impossibility that these seals have been broken because the Bible says when these first four seals are broken, there are going to be horses released. A white horse, first seal. A red horse, second seal. A black horse, third seal. And a pale horse, fourth seal. So these first four seals are connected with horses. And so this is the doctrine that we're going to understand. We're going to understand that these horses cannot ride upon this earth as long as the wheat is still on the earth. And we're going to see this excellent principle that God has in his word. Hallelujah. So in order to build upon this fact, let's go to Matthew chapter 9 to understand who the Lord is. Talking about King Jesus. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to begin at verse 35. We're going to lay down uh, the doctrine, line upon line. Remember how God tells us to do it, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. So here we go. Verse 35, Matthew chapter 9. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay? So, the key fact that I want you to understand from this passage of scripture is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest. So because Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest, he is going to give principles in his word about how the Lord of the harvest is going to harvest his crop. And he's not going to deviate from it, okay? Because it's the Lord of the harvest that instructs men and women who are farmers on the earth how to farm. And so if God gives the instructions of how to farm, which he's going to do in Isaiah chapter 28, he's going to abide by the same rules because he's the one who gives instructions about how to harvest. And this is going to nail home why those horsemen have not been released. But before we get to that, Isaiah 28, I also want to show you Matthew chapter 13, because not only is Jesus Christ the Lord of the harvest, but he's also the sower that goes forth to sow. Hallelujah. He's in control. Hallelujah. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Okay. Everything works according to his plan because he is everything. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bible says even the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. Hallelujah. He is the everything, okay? He is the great I am. He's all sufficient all by himself, hallelujah. And all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding, all counsel, all might comes from him, hallelujah. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to talk about the parable of the sower because Jesus Christ is also the sower. Verse 1, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. 
and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Hallelujah. Okay, so not only is Jesus Christ the Lord of the harvest, according to Matthew chapter 9, but he's also the sower who goes forth to sow. And he sows what? The word of God. Hallelujah. Because he is the word of God. That's why he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Jesus Christ, the word of God, the word made flesh, has gone out into this world to give his word to those who have ears to hear. And only those who have ears to hear are going to produce a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. And so when it's time for this crop to be harvested by the Lord of the harvest, Jesus Christ, and we're going to see that in Revelation chapter 14, God has a principle about how to harvest. And this is what we see in Isaiah 28. And so Isaiah 28 is the same chapter that I read from about how we are to understand knowledge and receive the message, the doctrine. In verses 9 and 10, Isaiah chapter 28. So in this same chapter where God tells us how we're going to understand his word, he also gives an excellent, an excellent illustration about how he will conduct the harvest. And we see this at the end, okay? And it's titled by uh, uh, this New King James Version, um, Listening to the Teaching of God, okay? <laughs> and how does he begin in verse 23? Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Okay, God doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God in Isaiah 28 who's speaking <laughs> is the same God who was speaking uh, to the multitudes in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so you got to have ears to hear. You got to have ears to hear. You got to have ears to hear. And if you have ears to hear, hear, verse 23 again, give ear and hear my voice. Listen. And hear my speech. Now, this is doctrine, my friends. I just can't emphasize it enough. Yeah, I'm going to repeat myself. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know some people get fed up. Oh, you keep on saying the same thing all the time. Well, it's evident that you have to say the same thing over and over again because that's what Jesus did. Okay? He said the same thing repeatedly. And he continued uh, to teach the people because they were dull of hearing. Okay? And people today are continually dull of hearing. Therefore, they come up with their own theories. They come up with their own doctrines, okay? And they say, hey, uh, because of coronavirus, you know, the first seal has been broken because he has a crown on his head. Corona. No. You mean, I mean, how foolish can you be? You know, I mean, it's just, it just, it's just so much rubbish. So much rubbish out here. So much rubbish. And that's why the Bible says in the last days, people will heap to themselves uh, teachers having itching ears, teaching them what they want to hear. And trust me, if those first four seals were broken, well, we would all be in a world of hurt. OK, <laughs> because that means that we've been left behind. OK, that means that we were the foolish virgins. If those first four seals were broken. Uh oh, <laughs> uh oh, my goodness. OK. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if those first four seals were broken, well, there'll be no more America. And we're going to see that right now. We're going to see that as we get into this teaching. Okay. There's going to be no more America on the day when them horses ride. I don't know. <laughs> on the day when them horses ride. Oh, no. You know, when that red horse, when he giddy up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when that red horse, when he giddy up. Oh, my goodness. You know, he's going to get out that gate now. <laughs> Now, you know that red horse, he going to get out that gate now, okay? <laughs> that red horse, he going to get out that gate, okay? Ooh-wee! Don't let me get started on that pale horse. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Don't even let me get started on that bad boy. Now, you know. <laughs> now, you know 
Child of God. That payholes? When he get out that gate, now you know he getting out hot. Ooh, you know that boy. He getting out hot. And you know he a bad boy. He got two names to him. His name is called Death. And hell follows with him. Now you know he coming out hot. Ooh, you know that bad boy. He coming out hot. Okay. Because he got a charge. <laughs> now you know that pair horse. He got a charge. My goodness. Now you know he got a charge from God. One fourth of all the earth given over to the pale horse when he ride. Woo -wee! Now you know that's a dark day. Okay? Talking about the first four seals have been opened uh, uh, because of everything that's been going on in the world. I don't know what these people, uh, I don't know what Bible they reading, uh, to be honest. I don't know what Bible they reading. Okay? Because there's no way those first four seals have been broken. And let's get back to this before I keep on ranting and raving, okay? But, you know, it's just, you know, like a head scratcher when you listen to these folks. And, you know, I believe some of them are sincere, but they just don't understand doctrine, you know? But not you, child of God, because God is teaching us right now. Listen to the teaching of God. Again, verse 23. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment, his God teaches him. Okay, so there we go. It's just the first part. So we see that God is the one who teaches the plowman, the farmer, the harvestman, how to harvest and plant a crop. Okay? This teaching comes from God. Okay? This teaching comes from God. And so if God is giving the farmer the instructions about how to plant, about how to sow, about how to break up your fallow ground. If God is the one who has given the wisdom to the farmer, to the harvestman, about how to produce a crop, well, it's evident that God is going to do the same thing. Hallelujah. God is going to do the same thing. And what's he been doing for the last 2,000 years? Matthew chapter 13. A sower has gone forth to sow. Okay, he's gone forth to sow. Okay, but uh, what does Isaiah 28 say? <laughs> what does Isaiah 28 say? Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? <laughs> okay, there's going to come an, an end, my friends. Okay, there's going to come an end because there has to be a harvest. Okay, there has to be a harvest. And that's what we're coming up to. You see, because Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the harvest, is going to harvest the crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold at the time of the harvest. And look what Isaiah 28 says about when this harvest comes. Verse 27. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick, and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground. That's the wheat. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever. Look at this. Look at this now. Look at it. Or break it with his cartwheel. Or crush it with his horsemen. Verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Okay. <laughs> Spirit of wisdom. Spirit of counsel, two of the seven spirits of God, right here, which describes this teaching to us, because this comes from the Lord of hosts. He just told us that when bread flour has to be ground, meaning that it has to be harvested, okay? The only way you're going to ground bread is when you harvest it. But you can't harvest the bread, you can't harvest the wheat, because what is wheat 
used for. It's used to make bread. You can't harvest the wheat in order to ground it into bread flour if you continually thresh it forever or you break it with your cartwheel or you crush it with your horsemen. That's the key. You can't crush the wheat with horsemen. That's the point. Okay. It's right here, verse 28, in the very chapter where God tells us how to understand doctrine. In the very chapter where God tells us to give ear and hear his voice and listen and hear his speech. In the very chapter where God tells us that he is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. This very chapter tells us that the only way for the wheat to be harvested in order for it to be made into bread flour so it can be ground is that it cannot be crushed with horsemen okay it cannot be broken with a cartwheel it cannot be threshed forever okay because at the time of the harvest that is when the lord of the harvest is going to come out with his sickle in his hand He's going to gather the wheat into his barn and the chaff is going to be burnt up in a fiery oven. Hallelujah. Okay, the wheat is going to be separated from the chaff on the day when God threshes, on the day when he separates the sheep from the goats. All the sheep are going to come into the father's house, all the wheat, hallelujah. All the wheat is going to be gathered into the barn because it's the harvest, while all the chaff is going to be trampled. Hallelujah. All the chaff is going to be trampled because at that time, when the Lord of the harvest swings in his sickle to gather the wheat, to separate the wheat from the chaff, everybody left behind. Well, that's when the horsemen are going to ride. <laughs> That's when the horsemen are going to trample. Okay, and they're going to trample upon everybody who's been left behind. Now, let's get into the prophecy so you can see this. Let's begin in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 14 so you can see the harvest take place. Look at the title, Reaping the Earth's Harvest. Verse 14, Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. Now, that should just clue you in right there. To understand that this is the rapture because in first Thessalonians chapter 4 that most famous passage the Bible tells us that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, our catching up, our harpazo, our rapture is connected to a cloud. And so here we see a white cloud appear. And who's on the white cloud? And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's about to gather the wheat in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, suddenly, instantaneously. For those of us who are watching and praying, we're going to be translated at this very moment because verse 15 tells us that the archangel is going to sound. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. There goes the voice of the archangel. Another key indication that matches line upon line with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There goes the voice of the archangel who tells Jesus, the son of man, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe, verse 16. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Hallelujah. 
Do you see any horsemen? <laughs> Do you see uh, the horsemen trampling upon the wheat at the time of the harvest? No. No, because God can't go against himself. This is his word, okay? This is his story, okay? This is his show. Hallelujah. You won't see a horseman trampling upon the wheat, okay? The wheat are going to be snatched up, harpazoed, raptured in a cloud, okay? There's not going to be any horseman trampling upon the wheat. He tells us this in Isaiah 28, okay? When it's time for the wheat to be made into bread, okay? <laughs> When it's time for the wheat to be harvested, hallelujah. When it's time for the wheat to be harvested, you don't thresh it forever, okay? That threshing only happens when Jesus Christ comes out of the temple, sitting upon a white cloud with the archangel, Michael, telling him, it's time for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The voice of the archangel, okay? It's only at that time that the wheat is going to be threshed because the threshing is going to involve the wheat being separated from the chaff. Just look at the parable of the ten virgins. Those who had oil, the Holy Spirit, were caught up. Those who had no oil, left behind. Simple as that. I can't make it any plainer, but God, he's given us numerous examples other than the parable of the ten virgins. But right there, you see the separation. Wheat separated from the chaff, okay? Other places he said on that day, two people will be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two people in the bed, one taken, the other left. There's going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. The wheat will be gathered into the barn at the time of the threshing, while the chaff will be burnt with unquenchable fire. Separation of the wheat from the chaff. Okay, because if you're the chaff, okay, if you've been left behind, well, now you're going to have to see them horses, okay? <laughs> you're going to see them horses now if you've been left behind. Now, now if you've been left behind, well, you ain't no wheat, okay? <laughs> you ain't no wheat if you've been left behind. Nope, nope. You ain't no wheat. No, you ain't no wheat. Nope, nope, nope. No wheat. <laughs> okay? You ain't no wheat. Left behind. Nope. You ain't no wheat. You a chaff, okay? If you've been left behind, on the cloudy and dark day. Oh my goodness. If you've been left behind. On the cloudy and dark day. Uh oh. <clears throat> you've been left behind. On the cloudy and dark day. Uh oh. You've been left behind. On the cloudy and dark day. the Bible says <laughs> Bible says in that day you've been left behind there shall be wailing in all streets and howling in all the highways and they shall cry alas alas Bible says all knees will be weak as water every face will be covered with blackness the Bible says, they who are strong among the mighty will flee away naked in that day. The Bible says in that day, all joy darkened. The Bible says in that day, strong drink will be bitter unto those who drink it. The Bible says in that day, they shall cast their silver and their gold into the streets. The Bible says in that day, baldness upon every head, sackcloth upon all loins. The Bible says in that day, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. The Bible says in that day, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. For he knows that he only has a short time left. Woe, 
worth the day. Okay. It's night night. Okay. <laughs> night night. Okay. Night night go. I told you. Night night go. That's it. That's all. Night night go. Time to go sleep. Now you little goat. Now you know. In the cloudy and dark day. Now you know you little goat. He gonna get some sleep now. <laughs> now you know you little goat. When the cloudy and dark day come. Now you know. You gonna get some sleep. Okay. You gonna get to sleep now you little goat. <laughs> now you know. When you been left behind. In the cloudy and dark day you little goat. You know you gonna get some sleep. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me let me rephrase that because you know, if God allows you to make it to the fifth trumpet, my goodness. If the Lord allows you to make it to the fifth trumpet, well, you ain't gonna get no sleep now. <laughs> you see, when you get to that fifth trumpet, you little goat, you gonna wish you could sleep, but you can't get no sleep then. No, no, no sleep then. Uh uh. <laughs> Bible says in that day, when the fifth trumpet sounds, uh oh. Watch out now. Okay. Watch out now, fifth trumpet. Watch now. Watch out now, fifth trumpet. Watch out. When that fifth trumpet sounds, uh oh, I saw a great star that had fallen from heaven, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. Uh oh. You talk about night, night, go. You talk about night, night, go. When that bottomless pit is open, uh-oh. Bible says, when that bottomless pit is opened. The Bible says, when the bottomless pit is open. The Bible says, there arose a smoke out of the pit as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. Uh oh. There go them locusts, fifth trumpet. Now you little goat, you thought you were gonna get some sleep. You thought you were gonna get some sleep when that fifth trumpet sounded. Uh oh. I told you it was night night goat. <laughs> but when that fifth trumpet sounded, well, you had to stay awake for a little bit now. <laughs> About five months, you had to stay awake. But you're gonna wanna go sleep. But you can't. Can't get no sleep then. Nope, nope. No sleep then, little goat. Nope, no. Nope. Can't get no sleep then, little goat. Bible says in that day, the torment will be for five months. And the torment of the locust was like the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And the Bible says in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Well, that's why I said I kind of messed up. <laughs> Because you ain't going to get no sleep if you make it to the fifth trumpet. You're going to try to get some sleep, but nope. You're going to stay awake, boy. You're going to stay awake, little goat. Yep, yep. You're going to stay awake, okay? You're going to stay awake. Walking dead, okay? You talk about Freddy Krueger? My goodness, Hollywood. Uh, uh, Hollywood. You talk about a nightmare on Elm Street, okay? Well, it's going to be a nightmare on Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem, Israel. Nightmare on Ben Yehuda. You talk about Freddy Krueger. Okay. <laughs> you talk about Freddy Krueger. Okay. You talk about Freddy Krueger. Now you know <laughs> Freddy Krueger, he got some tricks now. <laughs> now you know them Nightmare on Elm Street films. Them Hollywood blockbuster horror films, which was a preview of the dark and cloudy day. Now, you know Freddy Krueger has some tricks. Uh-oh. But when Abaddon come out that pit, woo-woo! <laughs> what when Abaddon come out that pit? Now, you talk about some tricks. My goodness. You talk about tricks when Abaddon come out that pit. Uh-oh. And all of his henchmen who've been locked away since the days of Noah. Now you know they ain't gonna play nice. No, no. Now you know, you little goat, they ain't gonna play nice. No, no. They've been locked up 
for thousands of years since the flood of Noah. Now you know they're going to be a little bit angry. <laughs> now you know they're going to be just a little bit angry. Okay. Now you know they're going to be just a little bit angry. Okay. So, there we go. You little goat. But guess what, goat? You don't have to be a goat no more. If you come to Jesus and you become born again, the Bible says if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You don't got to be no goat. You could become a sheep right here, right now, if you give your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says repent and believe the gospel. You do that by admitting that you're a sinner, believing the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures, he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. And then you confess it. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Simple as that. You see, but it begins with your repentance. When you finally say, forgive me, Lord, I've sinned against you. But that has to be your own decision. No one can force you to do it. No one can coerce you to do it. It has to come from your heart. It has to be a transformation of the heart because God wants to give you a new heart. He wants to take away that stony heart, that heart of a goat. And he wants to give you a heart of flesh by making you into a new creation. He wants to make you a sheep. But you have to give your life to Jesus Christ because he's the good shepherd of the sheep. You see? And if you become a sheep before the horses ride, before there's those first four seals are open, the Bible says you're going to escape. You're going to escape from everything that's about to come on the earth, and you're going to be caught up in the rapture. And the rapture is the next event on God's timeline. And so to end this teaching, I just want to show you how this harvest comes and how it's connected to the destruction of Babylon the Great and the destruction of Damascus, among many other things. But I just want to highlight a few things. Jeremiah chapter 51. Look at this. Begin at verse 27. Now remember, the whole theme is set up around Jesus Christ being the Lord of the harvest and how he as the Lord of the harvest conducts a harvest. And we see in Isaiah 28, exactly how he conducts a harvest. And so we see this harvest again in Jeremiah chapter 51, which speaks about the total destruction of Babylon, the United States of America. Verse 27, I'll begin here. Jeremiah chapter 51. Set up a banner in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations against her. Okay, so... We could go so many levels just right here. The banner in the land is Jesus Christ. Because when that banner is set up, for those who are the wheat, that banner over us is love. Hallelujah. He's Jehovah Nisi. Okay. The Lord our banner. Because God is love. Okay. Set up a banner in the land. Okay. When that banner is seen, well, that's the rapture. Okay. For those of us who are sheep, because his banner over us is going to be love. He is yod heh vav nisi Blow the trumpet among the nations. Well, we know that his coming is going to be announced with trumpets. Because his voice is as the sound of a trumpet. And so, there he is calling those who are sheep up to him. But for those who are left behind, well, look what he says. Prepare the nations against her. Talking about Babylon. United States of America. Call the kingdoms together against her. Ararat, Menai, and Ashkenaz. Appoint a general against her. Cause the horses to come up like bristling locusts. So there we go again. There goes the horses. Okay, so if you're not caught up <laughs> on the day when this happens, if you're not caught up and the banner over you isn't love, well, here come them horses, okay? Here come that red horse. And you know that red horse. He gonna ride, okay? You know that red horse. He gonna get you up now. He gonna get out that gate, boy, okay? And so here here come the horses, okay? 
left behind. There you go, you chaff. I told you. And right on his heels, there go that pale horse. Woo, no time to repent. Okay. <laughs> no time to repent. You didn't even see it coming. Caught like a thief in the night. Just like the Bible says. Okay. Verse 28. Prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, its governors, and all its rulers. All the land of his dominion. Verse 29. And the land will tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. No survivors. Okay. No survivors. I'm sorry to say it, but there's going to be no survivors in the United States of America because that pale horse, he going to ride. He going to have a flawless victory in America. Everybody left behind, they're caught. They're caught in that evil snare when it came suddenly upon them unawares. Because it's the apocalypse. <laughs> it's the apocalypse. No other way to say it. It's the end when this happens. It's the end. It's when the day of the Lord begins, okay? And it comes with sudden destruction. And everybody who's been left behind in the land of Babylon, who wasn't caught up, in the cloud, well, this is what God says. The whole land is going to be desolate. And because the whole land is going to be desolate, there's not going to remain one inhabitant. That means that the pale horse is going to swallow up everybody that's been left behind in America when the cloudy and dark day begins. And because not only are they going to be swallowed up by death, but here comes hell because they had no time to repent. The Bible says he's going to appoint many people their portion with the hypocrites. Okay. He's going to appoint many people who played the part but lacked the spirit. He's going to find them all out on that day. He's going to find them all out when the wheat is separated from the chaff. And that chaff is going to be burnt with unquenchable fire. Verse 30. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. Sounds like Afghanistan. They have remained in their strongholds. Sounds like what happened in Afghanistan. Their might has failed. They became like women. Sounds exactly like America today. You know, people don't even know their gender anymore. You know, they don't know if they're a he, she, a, a she, he. They don't know what they are. You know, I know I'm a male, though. Hallelujah. I'm a child of God. I know my identity. You see, but you got people like little nasty X, you know, with his belly all out, talking about, uh, you know, gay this, and gay that, you know. And here we are. <laughs> a, a land filled with degenerates. Okay, people who don't even know what their gender is anymore. And the mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. You saw what happened in Afghanistan. America tucked the tail and ran away. They have remained in their strongholds. Okay. Their might has failed. Look at America today. It's so weak. <laughs> America is so weak in the eyes of the world because of what happened in Afghanistan. You know, if I could see it, imagine what communist nations think of us. You know? North Korea, you know, Russia, China, okay? Imagine how they feel, okay? And they t they think totally different from us, okay, in the West. And so they definitely see America as blood in the water. They became like women. They have burned her dwelling places. The bars of her gates are broken. Verse 31, one runner will run to meet another and one messenger to meet another to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken on all sides. The passages are blocked. The reeds they have burned with fire. And the men of war are terrified. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor when it is time to thresh her. Yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. Hallelujah. And so we see right here, that when Babylon is destroyed, that's when the threshing happens. 
Okay, that's when the threshing happens. At the time when Babylon is destroyed, that is when the threshing happens. Okay, when Babylon is destroyed, that is when the wheat is going to be separated from the chaff. Hallelujah. You see, because you can't always thresh forever. Okay, bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever. Okay, it's a one-time event. <laughs> one-time event on a cloudy and dark day. Here comes the Lord. Revelation chapter 14, riding on a cloud. Okay, here comes the Lord, riding on a cloud. It's time to thresh. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's time to thresh. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's time to thresh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On the day when that white cloud appears. Ooh, you know God. He going to thresh now. <laughs> now you know God he gonna thresh hallelujah he gonna separate that wheat from that chaff now <laughs> now you know God he gonna separate the wheat from the chaff hallelujah and you know that when God separates the wheat from the chaff he don't want to have no spots he don't want to have no blemishes he don't want to have no wrinkles upon the wheat because the wheat is the bride of Christ, all the saints of God, part of the body of Christ. But for those who are the chaff, well, <laughs> they're full of blemishes, full of spots, full of wrinkles. And therefore, God, he gonna thresh. <laughs> and then we see the threshing right here in verse 17 uh, through 20. This is the threshing. These are those who are left behind. Verse 17, Revelation chapter 14. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are full of rot. So the angel thrusted his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city. And blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles. For 1,600 furlongs. Hallelujah. There goes the horses again. <laughs> there goes the horses bridles. You see. I mean I don't know how. I don't know how else God can make it so clear. Now you see. God says. When the wheat. Is separated from the chaff. The wheat is going to be caught up into this cloud. And you see no mention of horses up here. But when the separation. Happens and you've been left behind. Well guess what. There's horses now. Okay, there's horses now. Hallelujah. Just as we saw in Jeremiah chapter 51. For those who have been left behind, here come the horses. Okay, verse 27. Cause the horses to come up like the bristling locusts. Okay, there go the horses. You want to see the horses again? Isaiah chapter 21. Here comes the fall of Babylon proclaimed. Now look at the order. Look at it. I mean, it's just so plain as day that this is how you understand doctrine. This is how you get knowledge. Verse 1. The burden against the wilderness of the sea. As whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert from a terrible land. A distressing vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer deals treacherously, and the plunderer plunders. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Medea. All its sign I have made to cease. Therefore, my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold of me, like the pangs of a woman in labor. I was distressed. When I heard it, I was dismayed when I saw it. My heart wavered. Fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I longed, he turned into fear for me. Verse 5. Prepare the table. Set a watchman in the tower. Eat and drink. Arise, you princes. Anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said to me, Go, set a watchman. Let him declare what he sees. Verse 7. Now look at it. And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen. Okay, here goes the, here goes the horses. Okay, so now you know when these horses appear, uh oh, there's trouble. A chariot of donkeys and a chariot of camels. And he listened earnestly with great care. And he cried, A lion, my lord. I stand continually on my watchtower in the daytime. I have set at my post every night. And look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Okay, so you know. When these horses ride, there's going to be an announcement. There's going to be some trouble if you've been left behind. And look what happens. Then he answered and said, 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground. Verse 10, O oh, my threshing and the grain of my floor, that which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have declared to you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say except let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> Them first four seals haven't been broken. These first four seals have not been broken no matter what you hear on YouTube. No matter what type of teaching you're listening to, these first four seals have not been open. We just went through the Bible according to how God tells us to go through it. And I've just given you a few examples. Let's go to Isaiah 17 just to wrap it all up because people are familiar with Isaiah 17. Because this is the prophecy about the destruction of Damascus, which also happens on the cloudy and dark day. Verse 1, the burden of Damascus, behold... Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none will make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day, what day? The cloudy and dark day. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And it shall be as when the harvest men gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. So there goes the harvest again. At the time when Damascus is destroyed, at the time when the glory of Jacob is made thin, at the time when his fatness of his flesh shall wax lean, it's going to be at the time when the harvest men gathers the corn. Isaiah 28, we've been going over it. Matthew chapter 9, the Lord of the harvest. Revelation chapter 14, Jesus Christ sitting upon a white cloud. At the time of the harvest, at the time of the rapture, at the time when the wheat is separated from the chaff, the wheat is going to be gathered into his barn. Hallelujah. But for those who have been left behind, well, verse 6, yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bow, four or five in the utmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of hosts. Same thing we read in Revelation chapter 14. Here is the wheat gathered into the barn. Here goes everybody left behind, 17 through 20. And the horses are released. Well worth the day. I pray that this teaching was edifying. I pray that you learned something from it, because I surely did. And I pray that God was glorified. Hallelujah. And so, I pray that doctrine was understood and that knowledge was revealed and understood and therefore may we now apply it so we can have wisdom so that we can listen and obey to everything that God has told us to do, which is to bless his name forever and ever. By faith alone, in Christ alone, forever and ever and ever and ever. For the just shall live by faith. Until we speak again, Maranatha, amen.